Thanks, everybody, for coming. It, I, you know, it's my pleasure to be here on Flag Day and do a talk on this book that I wrote called Flag and American Biography. It's a history of the American flag uh, from the beginnings right up to the 21st century. It came out in 05. And um, there are a lot of books about the American flag, but this one happens to be the only true history of the flag from the beginnings right up to 21st century. So um, I, when I, uh, so we're all here on Flag Day, right? Does everybody know why June 14th is Flag Day and why we celebrate? You will before we finish here today. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, when I um, went to write this book, I had it in my head that we Americans had a special and unique feeling for our flag. But you can't write a book about something that you have thought about. So I went and did my homework. I read everything I could. I interviewed flag experts. I went on to a talk list on the, on the web and, uh, that was uh, sociology. And I, I posted this question that I just said. I'm, I'm writing a book about the American flag. I have this feeling. Americans have this special and unique feeling for our flag. I appreciate opinions from people. And they started pouring in by the dozens. And you know, first, I had to you know, weed out the ones from the people whose elevators didn't go to the top floor. <laughs> but there were lots of serious ones. And you know, virtually all, and they were mostly they were from people who um, lived in other countries but had lived here for some period of time or had visited here, had family and friends and spent time here. And virtually all of them said, you know, fill in the blank, we love our flag in, you know, Australia, Tanzania, you know, Austria. But we certainly don't love it the way you Americans do. Everywhere you go, you, we see your flag. And, um, you know, um, and you, know, you should be, not today on Flag Day, which I notice there are a lot of flags out there, which is great, but just keep an eye out after we talk today and just keep an eye out for that, that, that flag. So as I did more and more research, I came, I came to find six things that we Americans have uh, do and deal with our flag that no other country does. Or if another country does, they may do one or, and only part of it. So I'll go over them for you right now. One of them is the Pledge of Allegiance, right? So since 1892, we've had our school children pledge allegiance to the flag every morning. And the, the origins of the pledge, and I, I, I couldn't find any other country in the world that had a Pledge of Allegiance to their flag. Um, you know, um, it started uh, as a nation, there, we, a nationwide celebration of the 400th anniversary of what we used to call Columbus discovering America. Now we don't call it that. What do we call it? Columbus's voyage? No, he didn't discover it really. I mean, it was here, right? So, uh, a, a, ma a children's magazine editor in Boston um, named Bellamy wrote what he wanted to have as the centerpiece for a nationwide school children salute to the flag. And so on Columbus Day of 1892, hundreds of thousands of school children uh, recited in unison all over the country what they called Bellamy's salute. And it went like this. We pledge allegiance to our flag and to the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. So we pledge allegiance to our flag. Where do you, where do you think that comes from? What was going on in the 1890s? A massive influx of immigration. My grandparents, all four of them, came at that time from Central Europe, Eastern Europe, Southern Europe. And so I pledge allegiance to my flag, right? That was an effort to inculcate patriotism in the, these young immigrant children and the children of immigrants. Now, the flag salute was changed twice. First time in 1923 at the for a flag conference in Washington, which is when a whole bunch of groups met to put together uh, patriotic and religious and uh, military met to come up with one flag code, because everybody had different flag codes. So they changed it to, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And then the second change, I think you all remember it, I remember it, in 1954 when we put in under God. So it's only changed twice. But you know, the pledge itself is interesting because it was designed for school children. But in 1988, Congress for the first time started each session with a pledge to the flag. I think the House 
started and then the Senate. And since then, the pledge has spread. I mean, you know, uh, patriotic groups, veterans groups have done the pledge, but now we don't, it, you know, it's sort of morphed from a children's thing into something we see at every, I mean, you can go to a planning commission meeting, right? Or certainly board of supervisors or the state legislature and right on up through Congress. So no one else has the pledge. By the way, the original, the original Bellamy salute, I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of it, but it started out with, I pledge allegiance to my flag and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Yeah, they changed that in 1942 <laughs> during World War II for obvious reasons. I mean, you can, if, you, if you Google uh, flag salute, you can see pictures of school children from the 1920s and 30s doing the flag salute like that. So the second thing that we do that no one else does is today, the Flag Day holiday, um, June 14th, uh, which commemorates the first flag resolution passed by the Continental Second Continental Congress on June 14, 1777, which said, resolved that the flag of the United States shall be 13 stripes, alternate red and white, that the Union be 13 stars representing a blue field, uh, 13 stars white in a blue field representing a constellation. So Flag Day is, um, you know, there were various celebrations in the 19th century, but it wasn't until 1916, just before the US was about to go into World War I, that President Wilson declared the first Flag Day national holiday. Now, it's never been one of our big holidays, right? It's not a, like Christmas or Thanksgiving or Memorial Day. Or, but um, it, is, it is, every president since Wilson, since 1916, has declared this day Flag Day. And um, you know, the state of Pennsylvania used to be the only state in the union that, that had an official Flag Day. I, I'm, that's, it, it isn't anymore, is it? I mean, kids don't get off school today, do they? Or do we know? Yes or no? School's done, so how do we know? Are the banks closed today? <laughs> but anyway, at one point, uh, Pennsylvania was the lone state. So that's number two. The pledge is number one. Oh, does any other country have a Flag Day holiday? You know, I searched around. One time I was doing a talk and a man told me that he came from, I can't remember where it was now, I think it was either Bolivia or Peru, and he said, we do a flag day, but that's the one day of the year when we're asked to, to fly the flag. So no one else has anything like it. What about our national anthem? What's the name of it? The Star Spangled Banner. It's an ode to our flag. No other country has that, right? Um, maybe a flag is mentioned in, in other people's uh, national anthems, but certainly not like ours. Um, do you know what the National March of the United States is by congressional resolution? That is correct. The stars and stripes forever. We love our flag. We got the national anthem. We have the national march. Um, I'm not finished. We have two more. I don't know that any other country has a uh, national march dedicated to the flag. Now, flag groups, okay? So in the late 18, uh, in the late 1800s, 1880s, 1890s, um, flag groups started forming with the express purpose of promoting the proper use of the flag and patriotism. And you know, we still have uh, the other nonprofit groups, the National Flag Association, you know, I can't remember exact names of them, but we still have two of them today um, that work to promote you know, the proper use of the flag and to promote patriotism. I don't believe there's any other country that has nonprofit groups dedicated to their flag. And finally, the US flag code itself. Um, you know, if you Google US flag code, you're going to find in the federal code, in the federal code since 1942, there's a long series of guidelines for the proper use of the American flag, how to display it, when to display it, when to put on a half mast, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, no other country has anything like it. I did see the, the flag code of the Republic of Ireland, and it's a, a little like a two-page brochure with about four rules in it. So adding all these together, you know, the Pledge of Allegiance, Flag Day holiday, the National Anthem, the National March, flag groups, and the U.S. flag code, I do believe that Americans do have a special and unique feeling for our flag. And one of the things I found most interesting when I was doing the research for this book is given our special and unique feeling for the, our flag, 
The history of the flag, especially the early history of the flag, is filled with myth and misinformation. Basically, I'm sorry I have to tell you this, but everything you think you know about the history of the flag is either wrong or exaggerated. Shall I give you a few examples? Well, okay. <laughs> First of all, here we are. We do not know where the colors came from, where the stars came from, where the stripes came from. We don't know who designed the first American flag, and we don't know who made the first American flag. Am I correct? Do I hear Betsy Ross? <laughs> well, I'm sorry to tell you, <laughs> but let me just tell you. The Betsy Ross myth, where did it come from? Why do we think that, well, first of all, let me say, I think I know what most of you are thinking when I say Betsy Ross. That painting, right? She's sitting in the parlor on Arch Street. The flag is on her lap, she has that bonnet. The sun is shining rays right on the flag on her lap. George Washington and the flag committee from the Continental Congress are sitting, standing in front of her. Well, that, <laughs> that's completely made up, okay? That painting was painted in the 1890s. Um, there was no, if there was a flag committee of the Continental Congress, we have no record of it. So I don't want to just make a blanket statement and say that. And plus, that, you know, that represents Betsy Ross supposedly making, and, and George Washington telling her. And, um, you know, uh, George Washington had a little bit on his plate at that time. He never was there, basically. Um, if you go to the Betsy, so Americans did not n know the name Betsy Ross until 1870, 1870, almost 100 years after the fact. The occasion was her grandson gave a press conference at the Pennsylvania Historical Society in Philadelphia, and he announced that his grandmother made the first flag. And his, his proof was affidavits from her, she was dead, and his aunts saying that this happened. Well, um, as historians, when historians weigh historical evidence, you know, the best evidence to the worst, where do you think family stories are? <laughs> As about it. Why is that? Because it's kind of like that game of telephone you played when you were a kid, right? You're sitting in a circle, and the first kid goes, in Philadelphia in 1777, it was the first. Oh, no, sorry. My, gra <laughs> my grandmother made a flag in Philadelphia in 17. All of a sudden, it comes around, and it's the, it becomes the first. Um, and you know, think about the game of telephone, but morphed over generations and thousands of tellings. So um, the more they told it, listen, she, she wasn't even known as Betsy Ross back then. Her name was Elizabeth Claypool. Like she was married three times. To, she was widowed all three times. Uh, Ross was her first husband's name. Now, to her credit, um, she was a flag maker in Philadelphia, and she was a formidable woman. And there's nothing to take away against Elizabeth Claypool. But making the first American flag, it's just one of these myths that has come to, believe, to be belie believed as truth. And if you go to the Flag House Museum in Philadelphia on Arch Street, which by the way, probably was not Betsy Ross's house. They changed the street numbers in Philadelphia and it's a little dicey because she, they didn't have a more, you know, they rented that, it, so there's no official record. So that's where they think the house was. Maybe it was across the street. But so you walk in and you know, the brochures they give out and the the plaques on the wall speak of the family story or the myth. But then, of course, you walk upstairs and there's a young woman dressed up like Betsy Ross and she's sewing a flag and she will tell you how she made that star, right? George Washington wanted a star and he didn't know how to do it, so she took one snip of the scissors and came up with it. It's a great story and I'm sorry to, you know, I once did a talk and I, when we finished, a woman came up to me and she said, I was a fourth grade teacher for 40 years. <laughs> And I told children that Betsy Ross made the, you know, but we, we're just, we, Americans, we love, you know, firsts, you know, we like to be the first and the best and no, 
But you know, it's a great story, and it could be true, but I'm sorry to say it isn't. So as far as who designed the American flag, um, actually, we have a pretty good idea about who designed it. It, it wasn't Betsy Ross. Now, the, the thing is, you remember the, um, the, um, the first flag resolution. All it said was the flag has 13 stripes, alternate red and white, stars white in a blue field, as in a constellation. It said nothing about what the flag looked like. So um, we think that we know who the designer of the American flag is. He was a Pennsylvanian. His name was Francis Hopkinson. He was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He was a lawyer. He was the first graduate of the College of Philadelphia, which became the University of Pennsylvania. And he was also a heraldist. And he made designs. He was one, uh, he, uh, I think he designed this, uh, the Great Seal of the State of New Jersey, and he designed the Great the Seal of the United States Navy. And he was on one of the committees to design the Great Seal of the United States. Now you all think about the Great Seal of the United States. It's the one with the eagle clutching the arrows. Well, that Great Seal is red, white, and blue, and has the, the, the shield on the eagle's chest um, has 13 stars and 13 stripes. Now Hop there, there were three committees to design the Great Seal. Hopkinson was on one of them. But that design that he submitted was the one with the 13 stars and 13 stripes. So the, 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 that evidence, plus the fact that uh, Hopkinson um, presented a bill to Congress for his work. And on the bill, he listed what he did, this, that, and that. Number seven is design of the flag of the United States. So we're, we're reasonably certain that Francis Hopkinson designed the flag. But we still don't know what it looks like. Also, the, the so-called Betsy Ross flag, the 13 stars in a circle, you all know that. Well. None, we can, the earliest known so-called Betsy Ross flag is from the early 1800s. So we're almost all but certain that the Betsy Ross flag was also created well after the fact. But wait a minute, you say, what about the famous painting of Washington crossing the Delaware? Think about that one. Behind George Washington on the boat is Lieutenant James Monroe, and over his shoulder he's holding the Betsy Ross flag. Good? That painting was painted in 1854. <laughs> People, it's made up. And so are all other paintings in which you see the 13-star 13, the 13 Betsy Ross flag during the Revolution. It just wasn't a fact. Now, what did Hopkinson's flag look like? We don't know. We don't know because, again, none exists. However, we have a feeling that it was uh, a symmetrical design of 32323, three, three, 13 stars in the field with the stripes. So um, the... Um, the, the interesting fact about the uh, Francis Hopkinson flag um, is that um, it wasn't the first flag. The first flag of, of the United States was the Continental Colors, right? Do you all know what the Continental Colors is? This was the flag that George Washington raised on January 1st, 1776, when he started the Continental Army. Can you see this one right here? It's got what does it have in the canton instead of the stars and stripes? The Union Jack, right? That's the flag they raised. About a week later, Washington said, oops, perhaps it wouldn't be the greatest idea in the world to fly the flag of our enemy in a war against them. So even though we fought the, con the Continental Army fought the war officially under the Continental colors, it's also called the Grand Union flag, they put it away. And basically that war was fought under different unit and regimental and militia flags. Now, some of them had stars and stripes. Some had uh, uh, red, white, and blue. One of them, I think you probably know, is the Bennington flag. Remember this one with the number 76 in the canton spelled out in stars? Um, so, uh, and, and you know, a trivia question if there is a quiz later. Uh, <laughs> It, what war was the first war that the U.S. fought officially under the Stars and Stripes? Maybe you could Google it. But it was the Mexican War, actually, in 1848. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. So um, Francis Hopkinson and the flag. Now, the colors. Where did the colors come from? You know, we really don't know, again, because there's no documents. But guess what historians think it came from? The old Union Jack, red, white, and blue. That's the best evidence. And the other reason is because the Union Jack got its, 
got its way onto the continental color. So, um, and as far as the stars and stripes, where they came from, you know, we just don't know. There's no documents. Stars and heraldry, you know, do stand for something to strive for. So we think it came from there. Um, the, the French flag, which is also one of the oldest flags, you know, na na national flags did not come into being, really, until the middle of the 19th century. They just, people didn't associate countries with flags the way they do now. Um, but the French flag, the tricolor, the three broad stripes, that we could have borrowed that. Also the Dutch flag, don't forget the Dutch owned um, New York. We may have borrowed it from that. So that's kind of a, a little bit of a uh, sketch on what we don't, what we know and what we don't know about the early history of the American flag. Now, um, in the little time that's left, with, left for me, um, I wanted to talk about the flag code and flag protection law because they're completely or widely misunderstood. Okay, so we, we're, there was no such thing as a flag code or flag protection laws until the late 1880s, 1890s, when we had the first flag protection laws. They didn't have anything to do with politics. Nobody was burning flags back then. What happened was, because of advances in color printing and mass production, the image of the flag started appearing on dozens and then hundreds of products. And people started to not like it. And the, the straw that broke the camel's back, you remember I talked about these flag groups that formed at that time? Well, I, I had a brochure from one of those flag groups, and it listed hundreds of items that the flag was imprinted upon. And I think the momentum to, to, that, that, that brought us the first flag protection laws was when the stars and stripes image started appearing on beer and whiskey bottles. That seemed to the straw that broke the camel's back because by the turn of the 20th century, we had flag protection laws in every state of the union. Again, nothing to do with politics. It was against this rampant use of, of the flag on commercial products. And um, we did not have a federal flag protection law. Does anybody know when the federal, first federal flag protection law was passed by Congress? 1968, 1968, what was going on then? The Vietnam War, the height of the anti-war movement, people were burning flags. So Congress passed the first federal flag protection law in 1968. In 1989, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled all of the state and the federal flag protection law unconstitutional as on First Amendment grounds. In other words, flag burning is a First Amendment right of free speech. President George Bush the first was in. He did not take that very kindly. He introduced a new flag, federal flag protection law. It was passed by Congress in 1990. The day it passed, there were more flags burned on one day in U.S. history. And it went back to the Supreme Court, and in 1990, the Supreme Court reaffirmed that decision. So, since 1990, the flag protection laws are all off the books in all the states and, and the Fed. Now, that led to a movement in Congress to adopt a constitutional amendment, not a law, to amend the Constitution um, to uh, flag protection constitutional amendment. And it, and it was introduced, it's very short, it's, it says, the Congress shall have power to prohibit the physical desecration of the flag of the United States. And it was introduced into the House and Senate every year after 1990, right up through the mid 2000s. What do you call that decade, the previous one? 2000s, two, two aughts, the aughts. It was introduced, it was passed in sev several times in either the House or the Senate, but you know about, we just don't amend our Constitution willy-nilly, right? We only have, what, 27 amendments. In order to become an amendment, you don't, it, you doesn't have to pass Congress and the President sign it, right? What, ha what has to happen? Two-thirds vote in the House and Senate and three-fourths vote in the states. So it's probably unlikely we'll ever have a, um, a, constitutional, uh, a flag desecration constitutional amendment. Now, so that's the end of flag protection laws. Think of them over here. Over here, we have the flag code, which is very much part of the federal code. It's been in the federal code since 1942. You can look it up and you can read it. But the flag protection, the flag code, flag code, even though it's part of federal law, has no enforcement 
You know, there's no flag police. You will not be arrested if you break the flag code. Um, you have to think of it as a series of guidelines, okay? And a lot of the guidelines are kind of squishy and it's not worded very well and there doesn't seem to be any momentum to change it, but th they can be interpreted in lots of different ways. So I'm just gonna end by um, reading you the section of the flag code that deals with the, com the commercial use of the image of the American flag, okay? So section three um, of the US flag code, title four, paragraph one, chapter one, section eight, paragraph K says, it prohibits any article of merchandise or a receptacle for merchandise or article or thing for carrying or transporting merchandise upon which shall have been printed, painted, attached, or otherwise placed a representation of the flag to advertise, call attention to, decorate, mark, or distinguish the article or substance on which so placed. Any commercial use of the image <laughs> of the flag. Why, I'm proudly wearing my flag shirt today. I'm in violation of the flag code. I don't see any overt violations in the audience. But go home. Go into your closets. Those flag t-shirts, those flag hats, bikini underwear. <laughs> see some people nodding. Well, that, that gentleman over there. I'm sorry, sir. You are in violation of the flag code, and God bless you. But um, because that's my last thought. The, ir the irony of the whole <laughs> commercial use of the flag is that I would guess that 99.7% of all people who wear a flag t-shirt or a flag hat or flag bikini underwear are wearing it because they want to show their patriotism and love of country and love of the flag, and yet they are a technical violation of the law. So I'm gonna stop there. And uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. So thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>